morning. Nice to have you aboard this morning. Good morning all. How are we all this morning? Well, there, get my microphone in, it'll sound better. Morning, folks. Morning, everyone. Hope we're all feeling fine today. I'm not going to mess about this morning, folks. As you know, I'm out on the road. As you can see, I'm in the truck. So, good morning, Indy Truck TV and the truck. All right, coming to you today from somewhere in central Scotland. That's all I'm going to say. All right. <laughs> anyway, it's a miserable morning. It's a pretty cold, about seven degrees. All right. So we'll give you a couple of minutes for a couple more people to get on board, then we'll bar through this, folks, and I mean bar through it. We're going to get a run at this today. All right, because it's the review of the week, and that takes a wee while to get, get done. Right, so, morning, Bill. Morning, Val. Morning, Ian, Thomas, Alistair. Right, one mare on board, and then we get boogieing. Right, we're up to 53. Here we go. Coronavirus update. These are the figures for the 19th to the 11th, 2020, tested in Scotland since the pandemic reached our shores, 1,114,554, and that's plus 7,749 from Wednesday to Thursday. Tested positive since the pandemic reached our shores, 85,612, and that's plus 1,089 from Wednesday to Thursday. In hospital, there is 1,112 people, and that is doing 29 for Wednesday to Thursday. In the intensive care units, there are 85 people, that is doing 3 from Wednesday to Thursday. Deaths, I'm horrified to have to report another 50 people have succumbed to this bloody virus. Right, taking the hospital death toll to 3,420 bloody 7. Big number, big, big number. Community and hospital deaths combined now st stands at 5,135. Obviously, there's at least another 100 to go on that. But we'll get those numbers next week. All right. Review of the week's news. Now, right, let's get back to the start of the week. All right, here we go. Review of the week's news. Monday. Monday started on Bojo going into hiding. Bojo was contacted by the Kaput and no working properly, test and trace app in uh, England, and was told to self-isolate. Now, of course, Boris Johnson's one of the most important people in, in the UK, so he could have went into isolation and had one of the, the Westminster doctors come around and give him a test, and he could have been back at work right away. But no, Bojo's taking a fortnight off, because Cummins is just at his bookie booty due to the job. Um... Kane get his behookie booty out of the job, and uh, the Brexit deal's no going well. So Bojo's back in hiding, all right? Um, right, Monday. The EIS um, teaching union in Scotland are surveying members over um, concerns at the level four lockdown coming in. All right? Now... The, EIA, the head of the EIS, Larry Flanagan, says his teachers are no happy. Later in the week, the teachers have got something else to say about that. But anyway, um, at the beginning of the week, Larry Flanagan's mob said, eh, or Larry Flanagan said, the teachers are no happy. He's consulting them on strike action. So, as I said, there'll be more of that as week goes on. Monday, American company Moderna announces that it has developed a COVID vaccine which is 94.8% effective. It can, it, the, it can be stored and transported more easily than the a, a Pfizer vaccine. So it's probably going to be a front runner. Later in the week, we'll hear about uh, the Oxford the, um, vaccine as well. Okay. Uh, Monday. UK government to. Um,
Mate, uh, aye, uh, George Eustace, UK government, the um, minister for DEFRA, he makes an absolute fool of himself on Monday. And Monday, um, George Eustace tells hill farmers and shepherds that if the tariffs are going to be way too much for you when we drop out of the EU, then switch to beef farming. You get that? This guy's supposed to be start, <laughs> supposed to be the Minister for Agriculture and he doesn't realise that a uh, hill farming um, uh, and uh, a lot of the land that's being used for sheep is no suitable for anything but sheep. Maybe goats. They could maybe change to goats. All right. Anyway, Eustace, George Eustace just makes an absolute a, a fool of himself. Farmers are raging, and rightly so. They were told that everything would be fine after Brexit. That's not the case. All right, what else have we got? Right, eh, aye, Monday, First Minister's daily briefing, briefing. She gives out the stats and then tells people to stay where they bloody well are and abide by the rules. All right. Now, what's said on Monday is that if you can't keep where you are, she was going to put travel restrictions in law. That's what happens later in the week, OK? Um, the press tried to draw her as well on Monday on what the changes would be made on Tuesday in the um, weekly review of the COVID restrictions, and uh, the FM just would not get involved. OK. Right, the Monday, Neil Finlay. MSP, Labour, wants a third question on any future referendum ballot paper. Do you get that, folks? These are the people that insisted there was no third question on the last one, and then at the very last minute come along and promise a vow to give Scotland whatever it wants to stay in the UK. Back in 2014. We all know how that worked out, of course. The cuckoos in the nest after making promises and getting people to vote. No. Um... Then went into the Smith Commission and voted down every power that was available to the Scottish public except for the ability to change tax bans a wee bit within the existing powers and, of course, road signs. And as I said before, why there isn't a big F off West Westminster sign on that border yet, I don't know. What's the point of having powers there, eh, road signs, if you can't send Westminster a message via it? All right. Right, moving on to Tuesday. Okay, Tuesday, um, the papers in the morning were full of speculation about what was going to happen uh, when the First Minister took to the podium at lunchtime. All right, um, I, oh, um, there was also a Bojo the Clown telling 60 Northern MPs, English MPs, that devolution had been a disaster for Scotland. All right, we'll get a wee bit more into that as we go through. Hey, anyway, as Bojo's statement to these Northern MPs was that hey, um, devolution was a disaster for Scotland. Well, that's not the case. Devolution's been very, very good for Scotland, especially over the last 13 years. Because remember, in the previous seven years, we had a Labour government and a Labour Lib Dem government, and at the end of each year, they were giving the surplus back to Westminster. In fact, in the last Parliament before the, Labour, uh, the SNP took over, the Labour Lib Dem coalition gave 1.5 billion quid back to Westminster, claiming they couldn't find nothing in Scotland to spend it on. With all that bloody infrastructure, children gone hungry, and Labour were gaining money back. So, devolution hasn't been a disaster for Scotland, it's been excellent for Scotland. For a start, since the SNP came to power, 83,000 new social houses have been built. No prescription fees. Elderly get their bus pass at 60. No bridge tolls, no bedroom tax, free tuition fees. Right, 600 hours of uh, childcare rising to 1,200 hours as soon as this bloody pandemic so. Right, so, no just as the SNP and devolution being good for Scotland, they've been bloody excellent for Scotland. The quality of life went straight through the roof. I was reading a report, which we'll get to later, that says that the um, 9 out of 10 most deprived areas in Europe are now in Northern England. They used to be in Scotland, by the way. Okay. Right, anyway, after uh, after Bojo's uh, outrageous statement on Monday night to 60 uh, um, Tory, um, Northern, Northern English Tory MPs, Douglas Ross is dragged on to BBC Scotland in the morning 
to tell us all that Bojo didn't mean it. Bojo meant it was the SNP that was bad for Scotland and no devolution. Which we know is a lot of crap. The mask has slipped. Bojo and his mob are not just going to... Uh, um, they're not going to shut the Scottish part of the Parliament. They're going to bypass it. They're going to strip all the powers of it and do exactly what Neil Davison said they would do in 2014, prior to the 2014 referendum. They're going to strip that much powers at the place that they'd be as well meeting above a pub. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Good morning, Charlotte. All right. Tuesday, Tory plans to reform a... The judiciary came back into a um, view. OK. Over the weekend, Jacob Rees-Mogg um, had had a go. Right. He went on the attack. Mogg claims that in 2005, Tony Blair had made a mess of reforming the judiciary and forming the Supreme Court. All right. Truth is, that they, nothing wrong with the system that was set up. In fact, it recognised the equal, uh, the the fact that Scots law, English law, and Northern Irish law are equals. The way the Supreme Court was set up was actually no bad. Been a few jiggery pokery bits went on since then, made it a bit worse. But anyway, the Tories at the moment are no happy with the judiciary because the judiciary slapped them doing their, doing their port against, uh, the port against the Parliament. It slapped it doing their immigration. It slapped it doing their treatment of asylum seekers. So, you know, this particular... Uh, the Supreme Court's not been really generous to this, uh, um, this Tory government. So this Tory government wants to reform the judiciary and do away with the judicial, judicial reviews, which means that you and me lose our basic right to take the government to court if they infringe on our rights. Now, apparently, MP Robert Buckland QC is writing up a new set of a, um, directives for the Supreme Courts to follow. And they're also going to put it into law that the Supreme Court will not be able to interfere in constitutional matters, i.e. if Bojo wants to, porrigate, party, wants to prorogue Parliament again, then the judiciary wouldn't be able to interfere. And remember, there's no time limit on how long you can prorogue Parliament, officially. So Bojo could basically shut the Parliament down for the rest of, the next ter for the rest of this term of, of a, a Westminster up to 2024, once they've sorted this out and put it into law. There's scary times we live in, folks. Real scary times. You know, where human rights are under attack from the Conservative Party. Because um, they say they're going to get rid of the Human Rights Act right after a Brexit. The judiciary's been under attack and the poor are suffering really, really badly under this mob. In fact, you could call it genocide. Since this mob came to power 11 years ago, 250, add in the 60-odd thousand excess deaths for COVID that they're not counting as COVID deaths down that road. And you're looking at 300-odd thousand people have died under the last 11 years of Tory governments, all right? So the Tories are going to blow the judges out of the water so that they're not accountable to anybody. You know, remember in the Brexit bill, they put themselves above the law, eh, out of reach for any culpability for Brexit. And the Internal Market Bill, Section 32, they put themselves above the law. There you go. Ministers will be put above the law. So this is just the final step in making sure that the government can't be scrutinised by Parliament or cannot be scrutinised by the judiciary or the people. Right. Um, where are we? Right, lunchtime on Tuesday, and the First Minister addresses... Well, oh, tail end of lunchtime, half past one. Uh, the First Minister addresses the Parliament, and she tells the Parliament that the 11 local authorities are moving from level 3 to level 4, and the two local authorities are moving from level 3 down to level 2. OK. Now, level 4, the, the councils are, council areas that are coming to level 4 affect as of today at 6pm are Glasgow, East and West and Bartonshire, East Renfrewshire, uh, Renfrewshire, North and South Lanarkshire, East and South Ayrshire, uh, West Lothian and Stirling. So they're all now in level four. Well, at six o'clock today, they will all be in level down lock, uh, level four lockdown, and apparently it's going to stay that way for three weeks, okay, and the eleventh of December. And that the idea is to quash the infection rate, okay. So, um, East Lothian and Mid Lothian are to drop for level three to level two next Tuesday if the infection rate stays low there, okay. Um, other areas are in level two and level one. Okay. Right, if you need to know what a uh, level your council area, your local authority area is in, go to the uh, gov.scot website and then go to the tiered system, 
pick your postcode and it'll tell you what level your local authority is in and what that means to you, okay? Also, Tuesday, the First Minister put travel restrictions in place. If you live in a Tier 4 or Tier 3 level, um, you can't even move about it very much, all right? If you're in Tier 4, stay in Tier 4. If you're in Tier 3, stay in Tier 3. If you're in Tier 2, stay in a Tier 2 authority level you, uh, area you live in. If you're in Tier 1, well, you know, is it a good idea to leave a Tier 1 area or get into a Tier 2, Tier 4 when you're thinking the chances are you're going to bring the infection back? Okay, so travel restrictions are now in place, folks, and they make bloody good sense. Although the wee bit that doesn't make sense is international travel still open. Nuts. Okay. But remember, folks, stay in your, loco your, loca your locality, and that way there's less chance of you taking the infection out of your locale or the infection coming into your locale. Okay. Um, Tuesday, the Scottish Government we put legislation in place to ensure that uh, the Holyrood election next year can go uh, can go ahead, um, depending on the situation with COVID. Now, apparently, if this vaccine comes in uh, by the 1st of December and there's a rollout, then we should be able to have the election as normal um, next year. But if no, there's legislation in place to allow an earlier cut-off date for uh, postal votes, to allow postal votes to be counted first. And then uh, there's a... There's a Rules in place which allow the vote to take place over two or three day, uh, one or two three days to ensure that there's no too much close contact in the polling station. All right, so legislation put in place to accommodate next year's election. Tuesday, fisheries um, are back in the news. Speculation that West Coast shell fish fisher uh, fishermen will re-register their boats in Northern Ireland to avoid tariffs and taxes when we leave the EU on the 31st of December. Well, sorry, when we leave the EU transition period on the 31st of September. Now, this, of course, is just exactly what, what they'll do. It makes perfect sense. Why would you keep your boat registered in Scotland? And why would you land your catches in Scotland when you can land them in Northern Ireland and get straight into the EU without tariffs? Just re-register your boat in Northern Ireland, fish the, fish the Scottish waters as usual, and then quick hop across the unload at the other side of the Irish Sea. So, you know, this is another thing that's going to undermine the Scottish tax base, folks. I mean, you've got to remember the UK government is deliberately trying to undermine the Scottish tax base, make us look poorer. They've moved a lot of the military out of Scotland. Um, they have a, they paid pennies, uh, they paid young, sorry, to shop pennies and move production to Hull. Um, and they paid the Devon Creameries to shut the Arran Creameries and move back down the road. Right, so they're undermining their tax base, tax base and they're drawing jobs out of Scotland and they're drawing them into England. Okay. That's what the script is there. All right. Tuesday, the Alex Salmon Inquiry is back in the news. Um, we Muddle Fraser of the Tories. Wait, you get us. Muddle Fraser of the Tories. Claiming because the Scottish Government won't release the legal advice, the legal advice that there is corruption there. Yeah, you get that? The Tories calling anybody corrupt. That criminal cabal in Westminster are a bunch of crooks and Murdo Fraser's got a cheek to call the, the SNP government corrupt because they won't give legal advice they don't have to give. Remember, the remit for this bloody inquiry, as I've said, is very, very narrow. They're there to look at the human resources um, at policies that were implemented that led to the Alex Salmon debacle. That's all. They're not there to look into the characters or anything else. And uh, if they want to see where that uh, particular uh, set of rules and reg uh, regulations went wrong, they just have to ask the court of session. They've already pointed it out when Alex Salmon won his case where the court of session, where, where the, the, the human resources uh, procedures were wrong. That's the remit. That's the whole remit of the committee. A waste of bloody money, a waste of time and a lot of noise. The press are having a field day anyway. All right, and Murdo Fraser, hey, Murdo Fraser, imagine a Tory trying to tell anybody they're corrupt, Jesus Christ, eh? No real. Tuesday, the Guardian's reporting that the first day disaster facing the UK after Brexit is food shortages. Well, we knew that. You know, the warehouses run dry after 46 weeks and the stockpiling's gone, then food, of course, is going to be in short supply because of the backups at uh, Dover and Felixstowe. Um, or is it Folkestone? Where they, the... Uh, the Euro tunnel is. Anyway, 
So there you have it. Food shortages, medicine shortages in the early part of next year. But then, of course, Bojo and O'Connell have head, uh, headed to the hill, you know, with the money, millions of pounds that they've squirreled away in tax havens uh, after they uh, robbing the public purse. So, we're all going to go hungry and my granny's going to die because she can't get her, her medicine. Not a great prospect for 2021, is it? And we're in the middle of a bloody pandemic day. Tuesday evening rolls round and number 10 doubles down on the um, de devolution and disaster. All right. Tuesday evening, um, number 10 gives a statement. A spokesman for number 10 gives a statement to say that Bojo the Clown will speak for Scotland and the Union because Bojo the Clown is the Minister for the Union. So there you have it, folks. It's no other elected representatives that are going to represent us in Westminster. It's going to be Bojo the Clown. How wonderful is that, huh? Right, motoring on to Wednesday. Let's see what happened on Wednesday. Hey, Wednesday. Wednesday started and the media, the media whipping up a frenzy over Christmas. Um, the FM is First Minister of Scotland is getting it in the neck. You know, everybody wants a wee bit of relaxation and they want the rules relaxed for Christmas. Really, do they? Everybody that desperate to kill their grannies and get a turkey. That stuff for the media is gutter press crap. I've said this before. The media could be the heroes here. They could be pushing the public health message. But no, that's not what they're doing. They're attacking the public health message. And now the FM's are badging because they can't have an ordinary Christmas. Well, tough. It's a pandemic. People are bloody well dying. I'll tell you one thing. I don't need a turkey that bad and people run my table that bad that I want to see my granny did. So, you know, that stuff in the press challenging the, uh, consistently challenging the public health message and the BBC is just as guilty as anybody else as an outrage, an absolute outrage. And as I say, the press could be the heroes in the piece here, but they're no. They're no. They're the villain of the piece. In fact, you get right, don't you? When they're attacking the public health message and, you're under, and they're undermining the, the public health message, they're bloody well killing people! And they should be held to account. Wednesday, the National Audit Office releases its support into COVID spending and, in specific, the spending without tendering under the COVID-19 emergency legislation. All right. What the watchdog found was that a... Um, a fair chunk of the $10.5 billion worth of contracts that were on to do up until um, up until the uh, 31st of July went to um, cronies of Tory MPs and Tory ministers. All right. The watchdog also found that there was insufficient information on why certain critical spending was done. The watchdog went on to find that there was no... Um, there was no methods uh, put in place to be able to check for cronyism, to ensure there wasn't any conflicts of interest when these contracts were being on to do. Of course there was conflicts of interest. The first thing the watchdog found was that Tory MPs and Tory Lords um, uh, we, uh, had been honing out these contracts to their contacts. You know what I mean? So the Tories have been stealing like mad out of the public purse and the, public, the audit office lays it bare. Right. 8,600 8, contracts had been honed out up until um, the 31st of January, uh, sorry, 31st of July, with a value of a uh, 10.5 billion quid. 1,600 of these contracts went to people with connections to the Tory party. Unbelievable. That's corruption. As I said, you know, that's not a government doing that road, that's a bloody criminal cabal. They make the Mafia look like mugs. Right. Next up on Wednesday was first, it was a Prime Minister's questions. And as I said on Wednesday, I was only covering one question for Ian Blackford and one for Starmer. And I'm doing the same again today. Starmer went on a Bojo's remarks on devolution. Right. Starmer said that devolution was the Tory party's greatest achievement. Well, we know it wasn't, it, sorry, the Labour Party's greatest achievement. I should have said Red Tory Party's greatest achievement. But as we know, it wasn't. It was the European Council that forced it onto the UK. And uh, the European Commission threatened them 
threaten Tony Blair, Blair, if you don't get this devolution in place, we're going to kick you out of Europe. All right, that's how devolution came around. It wasn't the Labour Party at all. They were forced into the, the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe and the European Commission were kicking them out unless they go straight into uh, they go, uh, devolution on the table. Okay. Anyway, Bojo answers them because that's an open goal. Because Starmer, fully bought up and paid for member of the establishment, is also anti-democratic and anti-Scottish independence and against the will of the Scottish people and Bojo pointed that out. And Bojo scored. Starmer had to sit there and take it like a mug because there was nothing he could say because what Bojo was saying was the truth. Starmer's just as bad and as anti-democratic as the rest of them. They don't recognise Scotland's democracy. As far as they're concerned, there's only one election, and that's the UK general election, better known as the English general election because there's 550 English MPs. Right? So it doesn't matter which Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland want, they can't have it. You can never vote anything doing that England wants in that parliament because England has the majority of the MPs. Right? So, Starmer get his ass kicked for the first time for Bojo. And he deserved it. He opened the goal up and Bojo scored. Easy. All right. Right, next up on Wednesday was a Douglas Ross. He was interviewed by Channel 4 and what a fool he made himself. Dross was trying to defend Bojo's um, comments on devolution, saying that devolution had been a disaster for Scotland. Well, as yes, I explained earlier in the broadcast, it wasn't a disaster for Scotland, it was a disaster for England and the Westminster Parliament because the Scottish Parliament, no matter what colour of government it's had, has shown up. The UK government has been inadequate. We've got better health, better education, the whole bloody lot, you name it. And that's all been done through devolution. So, um, Dross has been interviewed by Channel 4, a newsreader, a interviewer and Dross gets his buttons pressed, right? Dross tries tries to defend Bojo, but the interviewer points out that Bojo he, um, isn't he a unionist at all. He's an English nationalist. He points out that he, um, the Scottish people don't like Bojo. They don't like the Conservatives. They don't like Brexit, and that he points out that Bojo was driving up support for Scottish independence. Dross went mental, especially the Bojo's no a unionist thing. Right, Dross Dross lost the heat. Leaning forward aggressively, shouting, giving it. No one who's not a dedicated unionist will be involved in any campaign that I fight. The guy's a nutter. He showed himself up to be a nutter. He lost all the moderates in the no campaign that day. Absolute bamport. Right? So Dross was tipped to the edge. The, the interviewer knew what he was doing. He didn't even have to try hard, the, 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 the Channel 4 interviewer. Right? And as I said, that's on my time when you have a look at it. It was reposted again by one of you guys. Thanks very much. All right. Wednesday, Corbyn's back in the Labour Party, isn't he? Starmer throws his uh, toys at the pram and he's in a huff. Corbyn uh, asserts that the um, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party is not as bad as people were making it out. It was just a case of the um, press and the opposition parties um, stirring the pot. Right. Anyway, Starmer throws his stairs. I say Starmer's throws it out of pram. Corbyn's back in the Labour Party, but he's not been allowed back into the Parliamentary Labour Party. So Corbyn will be sitting in Westminster as an independent while being a member of the Labour Party. Couldn't he make this stuff up? Now, the Labour Party, the splits in the Labour Party are becoming more and more serious, and there's every chance that the Labour Party may well. There's every chance the Labour Party may well split in two here. All right. Wednesday, the Lords vote doing the internal market bill again. 327 to 223. Right? They also stated that they were going to uh, make amendments to the power grab uh, clauses. Right? But it doesn't matter, folks. As I keep saying, it doesn't matter. Bojo's got his super majority. And because Bojo's got his super majority, any amendments, any clauses that are removed will be reinstated and voted through. So the internal market bill will go through the way it is, with the power grab in it and the international law breaking clauses in it. So, fun to come down the line, folks. Right, hey. What have we got? Right, back here in Scotland on Wednesday, 
Larry Flanagan was at it, as I say, with EIS. Anyway, during drive time um, on BBC Radio Scotland, eh, <laughs> drive time, BBC Radio Scotland, and eh, eh, John Beatty asked teachers to phone in on Larry Flanagan's survey and eh, potential strike action because the schools are staying open in level four areas. Anyway, all the teachers that phoned the phone in were all saying, hey, actually, we want to keep the schools open. It's better for the kids' mental health, and it's not that big a risk, right? Oh, of course, Flanagan was just making mischief, but he got his bum scalped by his teachers. I mean, he got his bahooky kicked by his teachers. There was one actually text into BBC Radio Scotland to tell Larry Flanagan to shut up, get his survey done, find out what the teachers think before he goes on the radio and opens his bloody mouth. So the teachers gave Larry Flanagan a good spanking on Wednesday. Quite funny. All right. Moving on to Thursday. We're motoring through this quite well, folks. How are we doing on the break front? Oof. Right, where are we? Thursday. Thursday starting speculation about Christmas and the possibility, if we play nice, that we might actually be able to get two or three families on the table instead of one or two. All right. Experts are warning that for every day of relaxation or Christmas, there will be five days lockdown in January to compensate for it, to try and bring things back under control. I don't know about you people, but hey, for a trade-off, that's not a very good trade-off. Saying that, you pick your lockdown and back into lockdown, I'm going to get some bloody peace now that I'm back out in the road. <laughs> it's a nightmare out there. You wouldn't think anybody was in tier three or tier four lockdown. It is a bloody nightmare out there. Six minutes left in my break. Okay, the other big story and the news on Thursday: Bojo's pledge to spend an additional 16 billion quid on defence over the next four years. Right? Now, 16 billion quid on defence. Are they having a laugh? There are kids starving. Why are four kids living in poverty? There are working families having to use food banks to get by. And he wants to spend 16 billion on weapons. This tells you all you need to know about these elitist halfwits doing that road. Bojo says that the UK hasn't been uh, using its might on the world stage for too long now. So he's going to spend a fortune on arms so that he can wave his wally about in the world stage and claim to be a big shot. You know, it's like a guy with a tiny penis going out and buying a big Ferrari to pull the birds. That's what the UK is. It's a phallic symbol. A poor phallic symbol. Absolutely outrageous behaviour. People are going starving and he's spending six. A bloody magic money tree seems to be able to appear for everything except for helping the people. Right, Thursday new poll um, rates the, the leaders in Scotland and England and a what the peoples uh, in Scotland think about the UK government compared to the Scottish government. All right. So, the First Minister of Scotland has a 74% approval rating on her handling of the pandemic. Meanwhile, Bojo, with the people of Scotland, has only got a 19% approval rating. Right. Now, um, the Brits in Scotland are seething about that. 19% approval rating for a... Bojo and 74% approval rating for uh, the First Minister. Right, now let's see how the people graded the two different governments. All right. The Scots rate the, the UK leader and the Scottish leaders, right? We've just had that back. Bojo, 19%. Um, a, um, that was his approval rating. 17% uh, said they didn't know. And 62% said uh, Bojo is making a right muggy it. Right. Nicola Sturgeon's uh, approval rating was at 74%. And 72% of Scots think she's handling the pandemic well. 11% said they didn't know. And 13% of Scots said they thought the uh, First Minister was doing a bad job. That would be 13% right, that uh, are hardcore British nationalists. All right. Uh, and, of course... On, th on a Thursday, we had the European uh, um, poverty ratings uh, for uh, area for area released. Um, uh, in the top 10 are the North England, uh, North England cities in the top 10, 
and number 10 was a, uh, an area of Belgium. Okay, now as I said earlier, all 10 of them used to be in Scotland. Castlemilk, Easterhus, uh, um, Drumchapel, uh, Granton, um, in Edinburgh, uh, Wester Hills in Edinburgh, uh, so, and then uh, Dundee and Aberdeen, right? So, our uh, 13 years of Scottish government, um, Scotland has climbed out of the ratings, the top 10 anyway, on uh, the most deprived areas in Europe. The top 10 are now in the north of England. So that's further proof that devolution actually has done well for Scotland. Rather than Scotland of 9 out of 10 poorest areas in Europe, by the way, all 10 of them used to be in the UK. There was 9, nine in Scotland and then the other one was in Liverpool. Right. But anyway, as I say, that's how good devolution has been for Scotland. We don't even rank in the first 10 of the most uh, poor and deprived places in Europe anymore. They say nine of them are in Teesside, the northwest of England, and in the north of England. Yeah, as I say, number 10 somewhere in Belgium. Right, Thursday. One of the world's biggest accounting firms, KPMG, says failure to secure a Brexit deal with half growth in the UK. Well, his growth's only sitting about 1% anyway. It's not that 44, is it? The economy's flatlining and it's about to go minus after Brexit. Anyway, KPMG says that if there's no Brexit deal, then UK growth will half. Bloody hell. We're in a bad way here, folks. Right. Thursday, it's announced that uh, Rishi Sunak, the UK Chancellor, is thinking of charging UK drivers a mileage charge for using the roads. The idea is for him to plug his 40 billion quid black hole and uh, he's thinking about hitting the motorists again. Motorists, it's always motorists. Anyway, I'll put the plebs off the road because they don't think that the plebs should have social mo mobility. They don't think you should be able to move from A to B to earn a living. Right? So, anyway, as I say, Thursday, Sunak's thinking about charging a mileage charge for using the roads. Okay. Also, Thursday, First Minister's rule run. Ruthie Tank Commander went on Christmas and the 25-day lockdown in January, if that's the price of Christmas, right? Now, that's all speculation, we don't know. We haven't got a clue whether that's the case or no. Ah, crap. Anyway, as I say, um, Ruthie went on Christmas and on uh, the consequences of Christmas. All right. Bouncy boy Richard Leonard, the Red Tories, he went on travel bans. He's no chuffed about the travel bans and he says they don't make any sense because international travel still on. But a bouncy boy might have a point. You know, the Greens, where the Greens go on? The Greens went on testing and will Parliament do mayor testing and mayor teachers for schools? Well, the Greens were put straight by the First Minister, weren't she? She said it for the first time. I've been shouting at her to say this forever. Just make it clear. Westminster controls the bus strings and you don't have the money for 2,000 teachers. You don't have the money to roll out mass testing. Just be honest, First Minister. That way the people will know exactly what the bloody situation is. Right, wee Wally Who went on. He went mental health. Now, you've got to, you've got to give Wally, Wally any of that. You know, when it comes to it, he's consistent on the mental health message. You know, he's been consistent on it for years. Um... So, for all we Wally then, he's a useless no-gooder. He's a useless no-gooder that's been pushing this one thing for years. So, I mean, when he's finished, and he'll probably finish it in the next election, he's probably got his behooky kicked out of office. But, I mean, when he's finished, at least Wally has put his effort into trying to improve the mental health of Scotland. So, I'm not going to go too harsh on we Wally this week. All right, Thursday, Pretty Patel is in the news again for the wrong reasons. Right, this time it's about complaints of her bullying um, her civil service staff. All right. So Mark Rumford, the previous Home Office Permanent Secretary, is taking Patel to an employment tribunal for constructive dismissal, or the way she behaved towards him and all. Right. It's expected the report eh, will find that Patel did break the ministerial code with her conduct and her behaviour, her bullying behaviour. OK, but it, it's not looking like Bojo will sack her. Bojo's trying his best not to sack her. Right. Eh, so... Even though that would normally be a sacking offence, bullying your workforce, um, 
and breaking the ministerial code would normally be a cycle of offence, I can't see Patel losing her job because Bojo's trying desperately to hold on to her, all right? So this one will probably be sat on until the press get bored with it and move on. Right. Thursday, Oliver Mundell quits the Scottish Tories front bench. Um, Oliver was the rural affairs spokesman, but he quit because the Tory party voted in favour of travel restrictions in Scotland to suppress the virus. He, Mundell didn't want travel restrictions put in place because his constituents go back and forth to England. But I don't know what his bloody complaint was because the people going out of that border are generally going out for work or education or medical treatment and they're all exempt. You can still travel for their reasons. But anyway, Mundell's threw his dummy out of the pram and he's quit the Tory front bench. Who cares? Who even knew he was on the Tory front bench? All as we know is that him and his father are trying to build a political dynasty. But between the two of them, the, leg the, the legacy will be failed. All right. Thursday, Gene Freeman, Scotland's uh, health secretary, laid out the programme for vaccination when a vaccine comes online. The elderly and healthcare workers will get it first. Makes perfect bloody sense, folks. They're the most at risk. The people on the front line, and I mean the front line, and, of course, the, the elderly and the infirm. So that sort of makes good sense that they get theirs first. All right. So that's what I've got for you in that part of the show. Let's get to today's part. As you know, I only did a paper review today. Um, so, ah, boy, I'll get you the paper review then. Okay, so Friday, the papers. What have we got? The Herald goes on. Oh, the record, sorry, goes on. Most Scots, uh, one million Scots to be vaccinated by January. Take it to mean the end of January, but hey, big number. The Herald goes on, same story. A million Scots to be vaccinated by the end of January. All right. The Scotsman goes on. New hopes uh, for every Scottish adult promised vaccine by spring. Christ almighty. That's a lot of adults, right? The Metro goes on. Um, festive vaccine rollout. You see there's a pattern forming here, folks. Um, the Looney Paper the Express goes on. 4.4 4 million Scots to get COVID jab. Of course. Right. If you're, going to, you're going to have to vaccinate up to 80, 90% of the people, obviously. I need to build up my air pressure before I can move, folks. Right, what else we got? Where are we? The eye goes on. COVID vaccination before Christmas. I really... Right, the Daily Field goes on. Case, case over lockdown travel ban. This is a Richard Leonard and his crap yesterday at First Ministers with a lockdown. All right. Now, the National goes on. Outrage over Tory plan for 16 billion splurge on the fence. And there is outrage when you've got millions of kids going to bed hungry every night. Pensioners having to choose between heat and eat. And the... Uh, and families, working families using food banks, then there's a bloody big problem there. So there is. A massive problem there. Huge problem. Funny how that magic money tree always shows up when there's an infrastructure programme that England needs or if there's some defence spending or something like that needs done. Isn't that fascinating, folks, that the money tree works, but it only works when England needs something or... The Tory government needs to look good. Absolutely out bloody rageous. Ah, I let the kids starve, but let's go build some bombs and then go and blow up some kids in another part of the world with it. By the way, they're talking about a robot defence system this time, where you don't even have to look at people you're killing in the eyes. Right. The Telegraph goes on. Army to hire specialists for high-tech High-tech future war. That's what I'm talking about. Drones, robots, that sort of thing. So, the poor buggers out there in their waddies in the desert are not going to see the people that killed them. They're just going to hear a buzz as the bomb comes and smacks them, man. Disgusting concept. Right, the time goes on. Patel guilty of bullying. Aye, we know that she is a bit of a bully. She even, to try, even tried to bully the judiciary, Christ. Right. The sun goes on. One little quid will help kids. It's a charity thing. The son's raising money for charity, all right? 
and the star goes on, new jab, joy. You wait all year for a COVID vaccine, and then three comes along at once. This is where I get to the bit where I was going to tell you about the Oxford trials, right? The Oxford trials have moved up a gear, and they, they're hoping to get it licensed and get it into production ASAP, because the trials have done so far have been very successful. So we now have three vaccines on the road, are on the go, and as uh, the, first, uh, the health minister, Gene Freeman, said, that's good, that means there's a basket load. So if some people are having a rea an adverse reaction to one vaccine, then they could be vaccinated with another vaccine instead. All right. Sorry about the noise, folks. Anyway, I need to wrap it up there. It's time to get to uh, get back to work, folks. Now, the usual stuff. Look after yourselves. Does the matter you believe in this virus or no? Follow facts. Face masks in enclosed public, space, uh, enclosed public spaces. Avoid large gatherings. Clean hands and surfaces regularly. Two metre social distancing. And... Book a test if you need one. You know, listen, look after each other over the weekend. As you know, I don't broadcast over the weekend. That's Sarah and I's time. Well, actually, that's changed a wee bit now. As I said, I will broadcast at the weekend if something needs debunked. All right. But anyway, that's it for me for this week. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Look after each other. Stay well. Have a good, have a nice weekend. <laughs>